name's Tom Roth, and I'm working with Ron Benson, who is the farm manager for Benson Farms. They're located in uh, Clay Center, Kansas. And we're going to talk about um, dynamic soil properties. And we have a pretty extensive set of instrumentation out here. And some of that is directly related to those soil properties. So dynamic soil properties are soil properties that change <coughs> excuse me, with management and what kind of management activities that uh, we'll be doing out here that can influence those dynamic soil properties. So on this pole out here we have a time-lapse camera and so that time-lapse camera is measuring um, the growth of that soybean plant. And the other thing we can do once we finish the growing season is we can use Canapeo to determine what kind of crop canopy we have, but we can also see when that plant is going under stress. And so another piece of this project, um, you can see where the beans, soybeans are a little taller. So that's where we, they buried uh, a variety of soil, sensor, soil moisture sensors out there. And so we're gonna be, we can measure uh, the water content of the soil. And you, yeah. and you said you have five different types of soil moisture sensors? We do. And um, do you remember what the, what the depths are that those are installed? Those are at 20, 30, 50, 150, and 200 centimeters. All right. And then you guys do manual measurements for the surface, right? Yes, we use a Campbell Scientific HydroSense 2. Okay. Uh, the HS2 is kind of, it's a, a neat little piece of equipment. Um, it's mounted on a, 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 a basically a, an insertion pole, and it has a GPS unit built into it. So you huh. GP you can GPS the locations of all your samples out there in the field. Um, they did have some flags out there that they were following. It looks <laughs> like the crop's gotten high enough now that their their flag line's not there. I see one barely. Yeah. <laughs> and and so they they're measuring those properties, um, you know. And when we think of soil water and, and infiltration, how will the those properties that affect that, you know, uh, aggregate stability, pore size, um, you know, those factors? How how does that change over time? with the management that a producer would use. Uh, give you a little background on Ron. Ron's, this field has been in no-till production for about 20 years. Um, we did do some work on the lower terraces to get them, to get the storage that we needed to, for the runoff flumes. So he did do um, a tillage pass because he had to level those, or build those terraces up and then they're to smooth the channel and the terrace out, they, they, they took a disc and, and disced it to smooth it out. Mm -hmm. So it's had one tillage pass in the last 20 years. And that's kind of normal practice anyway. It's usually about every five years you want to rebuild you wanna, you terraces. Rebuild that terrace, at least for broad based terraces. Historically, where do we see low points in terraces? Well, sometimes they're in a bend. Yeah. The other spot is usually right at the outlet. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll be lower than the rest of the terrace. So terrace maintenance is not something that would be uncommon. Yeah. Out here. Yeah. Um, but Ron was not happy that he had to pull tillage equipment. He doesn't like that. <laughs> That's good. Um, well, so for the areas where you have the so with the soybeans being taller, uh, where you guys have installed all the soil moisture equipment, do you think that's because uh, there, there's compaction that was there that got broken up a little bit? It could be. Um, this these these soils are a high clay content soil. Um, also, if you think about where we would normally not sample for compaction, mm -hmm. 
probably, you know, at, at the end of your feed, edge of your field is not a good place to sample for convection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, because, you know, usually you're, you're going up and over the terraces or you have some type of equipment that's on the edge of the field. And so when you're measuring compaction, bolt density is a good indicator of that. Yeah. So you would want to be further out into the field, you know, a, a fairly good, you know, I would say two to 300 feet yeah. out into the field. And, you know, it, obviously there are indicators that you want to look at if you're going to be sampling for soil compaction, you know, bulk density, um, stay out of wheel tracks. And if you see wheel tracks out there, you know, those types of indicators where you want to be away from those wheel tracks. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have other uh, sensors in the field besides soil moisture sensors? Um, or is that is that the primary? Well, that's the primary. Like I said, we've got a, the time lapse camera here. Uh -huh. um, this is where all of the equipment is wired into, and there's a data logger if you want to. <coughs> it, uh, and here, right, if you. There's the sensors, and then there's a soil view by meter that's also out here. Okay. It's, it's in the field. So that's how we got five. We've got five different sensors out there. All right. Uh, we can wa walk down here a little bit and go over some of the climate data that we're collecting. So we've got actually. This is the Department of Redundancy Department. We have three rain gauges. <laughs> We've got your good old, um, this one happens to be from the, uh, from K-State. Uh, Coco Ross. Yeah, the Coco, this is a Coco Ross gauge. This is a heated rain gauge. So in, in the winter time, if we get snow fall and it falls down into there's a little cone here. It'll fall into that cone and it'll melt and then we can measure the rainfall that way. Okay. And then this right here is another, it's a self-tipping rain gauge. Okay, like a, like a tipping bucket? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, this is a 90 watt solar panel. We've also got um, temperature, wind velocity and direction. Um, We've got a solar radiation gauge up there. And so basically we have most of the information we would need to compute evapotranspiration. Um, again, these are just 90 watt solar panels. Um, they power the sampling unit over here. Um, it's also got a heater. So we can collect runoff. If, if, if we would have runoff in the middle of winter, we can make sure that we capture that runoff event. Mm -hmm. That was part of the uh, requirement from NRCS on the funding end of it to be able to collect runoff constantly year round. Interesting. Um, so this has two 12 volt batteries and that powers the sampler. Um, a sampler is a Campbell Scientific Avalanche. Um, it uses the bubbler flow module. So that module, there are little impulses of air that pulls the air in here. And then there's a, a pump. And so it compresses the air and sends it out through this little black hose and there's a stainless steel rod over here and a little well. And what it does is it, it's a, a pressure transducer that measures um, the depth of the water. And when things dry out, I need to come back and clean out my So 
So this is this is a an H flume. Um, the flume is actually from here to here. That's the flume. The rest of it is the approach part. Um, you know, if, when we get a runoff event, water drops into the flume. In that little well right there, it measures the depth. Once it reaches a certain depth and a certain flow rip, flow volume, that triggers the sampler to start sampling. Yep. And the purpose of the approach is to basically create laminar flow. Yes. Uh, so that there's only one uh, equation where you can directly translate depth of water to uh, volume of water. Right. Yep. And and that's programmed into the sampler. Uh -huh. And so the things that, that NRCS is interested in learning, um, you know, the, the dynamic soil properties that they're wanting to measure and how that influences runoff, um, you know, they're, they're looking at saturated hydraulic conductivity. Um, they're looking at aggregate stability they're looking at organic matter and the different fractions of organic matter that they can measure um, using mid-infrared spectroscopy. And so those are some of the things that they're looking at. They're also looking at uh, soil microbiology. So one of the things that they're going to be using to measure that is phospholipid fatty acid analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and those a lot of those measurements are going to be taken after the soybean crop comes off. And they've already been doing some work um, with equipment measuring the saturated hydraulic conductivity of the surface layer. But if they were, you know, wanting to know how that management is going to affect the hydraulic conductivity at greater depths than the surface will require a little bit more extensive use of equipment. Mm -hmm. All right. And you mentioned there was two treatments uh, that are applied to these, uh, these different watersheds, right? Okay, so there's actually going to be, well, if you count the control, there's four. Okay. So, and they have to, the, 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 purpose of this experiment is to see how changes in management affect phosphorus runoff. And so the managements are going to be uh, basically maintain farmer practice, manage their phosphorus applications just like they've been managing them historically. There's another one <clears throat> that's going to be um, a sufficiency treatment. So there will be no phosphorus applied until you hit tr hit a, a trigger level for sufficiency application. Uh -huh. There's going to be another treatment which will be build and maintain, but looking at a, a placement option. And then the fourth treatment will be planning a, using <clears throat> a broadcast application with cover crops. All right. So those are the four treatments. Now, our first three years, we're in year two right now. Good thing about it being in a drought, you don't have runoff very often. So we really didn't miss any events last year, last summer, mm -hmm. because we really never had a runoff event. Um, this year we've we've captured runoff. Uh, we've got that lab analysis back, and we're working with Dr. Nathan Nelson over at Kansas State University um, to start learning how to interpret that data mm -hmm. and and making sure that we're interpreting it correctly. Um, so. This year and next year, 
we're still maintain this as, as a control. All four are going to be treated the same through year three and years four through nine is when we'll start doing our changes in management. Okay. It's all still going to be no-till. Um, this top watershed is the one that will have a cover crop and it will be a winter cereal is the cover crop. All right. Um, yeah, so we're, we're looking at the, t the top watershed now and I'm going to pan this way and you can see I got several more flumes uh, along this grass waterway. And how, how many how many terraces are there? Four? Four. Four. All right. And so each terrace uh, is basically its own watershed and they all drain into one of these uh, one of these H flumes. So Yes. And I always thought no till runoff was real clean. Yeah. <laughs> and it is, I mean it's not it's not anything like you would see in a conventional field. I was just after every runoff event, I have to come up and clean these flumes out. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that always, uh, I think surprises me as well as students is if you think about uh, the amount of erosion that occurs on a field. So if you have a tolerable rate of say five tons per acre per year, yep. if you have uh, say a hundred acres, I mean, that's 500 tons. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, then think about you think about that. That's usually your surface layer. Yeah. So your nutrients are usually highly concentrated in that surface area, mm -hmm. and also a lot of your soil organic matter is is in that surface layer. Yeah. And so you're losing a lot of things that that have high value to you. Yep. Yeah. Organic matter and nutrients are are definitely. Yeah, very high value and you want to keep them on the field yes. and when they're not on the field and if they run off uh, then they cause other problems too.